It's a crisp late summer day on the Olympic Peninsula, about four miles south of Port Townsend. This morning, a group of naturalists and concerned citizens has arrived as part of a guided tour of the Bulis Preserve, a forest of about 130 acres. In a few days, a section of the Bulis comprising a little less than 30 acres will become a harvesting site. It's all part of a long-term management plan developed by the Jefferson Land Trust, a nonprofit conservation group that owns the property. Relying on input from community members, natural resource managers, and scientists, the Jefferson Land Trust works to protect working forests to ensure sustainable productions, wildlife habitats, scenic views, and recreational uses. Earl Kong is a forest management specialist who lives on the property. He knows and loves these trees the same way a parent knows and loves his children. Managing logging operations for many years, but and this is the first time I've done one where I can walk and work. The Olympic Peninsula is home to some of the oldest, largest trees in the world. Douglas fir first appeared in the Northwest about 7,000 years ago, after the last ice age. These magnificent trees grow quickly here, often reaching heights of 200 feet and diameters of up to 8 feet. Douglas fir grows fastest up to age 40, and then it starts to slow down. By the time we get to age 60, it's slowing down quite a bit. These trees are about 80 to 100 years old. They're not producing very much. They're producing three new trees of average size per acre per year, but it should do better than that. What we'd like to do is take off these old, dominant, stagnated trees and get the young, healthy trees growing. In other words, taking away the, no, the low producing, low value trees and replace them with healthy, young, fast growing, productive trees. The Butis Preserve was donated to Jefferson Land Trust in 1997 by Erica Butis in honor of her husband Janice. The Butises, born in Latvia, immigrated to the United States after the end of World War II. An author and artist, Earl Kong, was born in Jamaica. He and Janice Bulis often roamed these woods together. And when he had enough to, like, a few hundred dollars, he'd buy another five acres. And then, so in five acre chunks over the years, they acquired the whole 160 acres. His career goals was to be a forester, and he was in forestry school when the war broke out. So they, Jan was very knowledgeable about forestry, and Erica was a map maker, cartographer. Jan likes to walk through and use the sun to guide us, you know, north, south. But on a foggy day, we'd, we'd get lost. The dogs always came with us when we went to the woods. Over the years, it was Duke, a German Shepherd, and Prince, another German Shepherd, and Strider, uh, Black Lab, and D.O.G., a Beagle. There was a storm, it's known as the Thanksgiving Day Storm. It blew down quite a few of the trees on the, on the whole claim. Jan, Jan hired me to salvage the, the Winthrow trees and manufacture. And from that, uh, Jan and I kind of managed that project or, together. And after that, we kind of developed into friends. And we visited each other over the years. Erica was very strong-willed. And when she spoke, you listened. Yeah, Jan had a, had a different way of seeing things. And he'd see the trees for more than cutting them down. And he had a more spiritual view of the the woods around here. Mm -hmm. Loosely speaking, I've covered the whole the whole property. I've cruised it, I've gridded it, I've taken uh, measurement plots every 200 feet throughout the whole property, so that covers it. But 
to say I there's always something there that surprises you every time you go out there. No, I think it's in good hands. I think the Jefferson Land Trust does a good job of um, taking care of um, eas easements that they've acquired. Jefferson Land Trust is a local nonprofit conservation organization that works with the community to protect open space, working lands, and habitat forever. When we were gifted this property, there were several wishes that Erica had for the future of the land. One was that 90 acres of the property was maintained as a preserve, so essentially managed um, with with the goal in mind of having the forest stay the same. And she also understood that the land trust would need funds to be able to manage the property in perpetuity. So she made a provision in her gift that we could actually selectively harvest from a 26 acre portion of the property. And we're in the process of doing another managed cut to um, provide some income, but also really to improve the forest. What's going to happen in long range planning is we're going to remove the overstory and so this forest will gradually go to a stand of mostly cedar with a few fir, whereas what it is now is mostly fir with a few cedar. So when we remove the Douglas fir, we will be giving all the light and water and nutrients to the existing cedar in the stand. We're going to evaluate the density after the harvest. If we get a lot of sunlight onto the forest floor, we'll plant Douglas fir. In areas where we're still getting shade, we'll promote cedar. Earl Kong's professional expertise combined with his personal experience on the property makes his judgments particularly worthy. In addition, Jefferson Land Trust staff and volunteers have studied the Beulis. They've determined that there's an average of 140 trees per acre. The plan is to reduce the average stems per acre to an average spacing of 30 feet, allowing more sunlight to permeate the forest and promote restoration. Later, up to 200 seedings per acre will be planted with the goal of establishing an optimum of about 300 trees per acre. I think the timing is perfect for transitioning from the, by removing half the overstory and promoting the intermediate story. In a few days, the crucial process of tree selection will begin. The overall goals of our management really have to do with both habitat preservation, habitat protection, you know, water quality, as well as the production of timber and revenue from those, the, the forest products. Eric Kingfisher has been studying, documenting, and helping to manage conservation properties in the Pacific Northwest for nearly 20 years. As the Jefferson Land Trust Stewardship Director, he brings valuable expertise in forest ecology and natural lands management, with an emphasis on the stewardship of conservation land. His is a critical professional focus that's crucial to the careful implementation of the Beulist Forest Management Plan. Yeah. If we let it go, it's just going to look that the same way in mm -hmm. 20, 30 years. But the harvest here on this property has been laid out um, to reduce the number of stems per acre on this property, allowing more sunlight to come down through the canopy down into the intermediate and understory layers of existing trees. If you got 200 trees per acre and you're going to take 30 percent, well it's better to paint the trees you're going to take. Right. But if you're going to leave 30 percent, 
then it's better to plant the trees you're going to leave. Maybe I should say I value the working forest landscape. It provides, you know, jobs and revenue and habitat and all those things. And this is a, a, a small scale example of the kind of forestry that can meet multiple goals, um, both the timber production, um, and revenue, um, uh, e you know, environmental or eco ecological uh, values, and even social values with the, like I said, the jobs and lumber, etc. Probably 300 years old. That's what I did. Yeah. The threats that I consider for this property are uh, more related to outside, third-party kind of threats. And in 1914, two teenagers had a fire on a wagon, and they went through the Quimper and set fire all over, and they burned everything from Hastings to Chimico. The working force portion of this property is, um, an, is also an opportunity for all of us to learn. But are these growing like this because they're crowded or because this is just a poor site because it's so dry? And Both. Okay. Poor site and, and it was, it's carrying what about 300 stems per acre. It should be carrying two. So that's why they're smaller. But that one in the back got to go. It's got that defect. We select trees for harvest by identifying those with overlapping crowns or older trees that are shading out or crowding out nearby younger trees. Also, we look for defective trees with forked or leaning trunks or too many branches. However, the most defective trees provide the best habitat for wildlife, so we leave those whenever possible. property is certified as under the Forest Stewardship Council certification program, uh, which is a mark of responsible forestry. And so we're checked on every year to ensure that uh, any kind of management we do on this property is uh, meets the standards of the Forest Stewardship Council. The area around what is now Port Townsend was one enormous glacier about 10,000 years ago. That's what we call the last ice age, but actually it was much drier and warmer. Before Europeans settled this area, the northern Quimper Peninsula was utilized by native peoples. The Chimicum people lived right here at the mouth of Chimicum Creek for its strategic location at the mouth of Admiralty Inlet and its abundant natural resources. In 1792, Captain George Vancouver sailed right through here. On board with him was ship surgeon Archibald Mengus. Mengus was also an amateur naturalist, and he came ashore during these excursions to sketch the native vegetation, leaving us some of the first records of what this area used to look like. We had a most delightful and extensive landscape covered with fine verdure, and here and there interspersed with irregular clumps of trees whose dark hue made a beautiful contrast, aided by the picturesque appearance of a rugged barrier of high mountains, which at some distance terminated our prospect in lofty summits covered with perpetual snow. After a long walk with Captain Vancouver, we met with a thick pine forest. We pursued our walk to the southeast along the shore and past some perpendicular sandy cliffs, which exposed to view some thick strata of fine foolish earth. From this point, we had a fine view of a very lofty, round-topped mountain covered with snow about five and twenty leagues off, nearly in a south-easterly direction. The habitat we have here today is somewhat like that that Archibald Menzies documented. Although at his time the trees were probably larger, mainly Douglas fir, and the understory was probably much less dense. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, European settlers 
logged the big old growth trees. And here at Beulis Preserve, the trees have regenerated naturally. So many of the trees we are looking at here today are 80 to 140 years old. Some were even saplings at the time that the original old growth were cut. Beulis Preserve is also home to some really unusual and amazing plant communities. We have rattlesnake plantain, we've got a lot of salal, organ grape, Pacific rhododendron, and of course the ever-present Douglas fir. And a part of our management objective is to also think about these understory vegetations as we use the timber from this preserve to help take care of the property for the long term. Part of our management is dealing with non-native species that come in to crowd out these important native plants that we're here to help protect. Part of that is Scots broom and Himalayan blackberry. We also have herb robert and holly. Some of the animals that use this managed forest and the nature preserve include black bear, um, bobcat, coyote, pileated woodpecker, screech owl, and dozens of other birds. Although we won't know exactly what vegetation was here at the time of Archibald Menzies, or before him at the heyday of the native tribes, we do know that the native peoples widely used the northern Quimper Peninsula in their hunting and foraging habits, and they actively managed the forest with fire and other techniques to change the understory vegetation. When European settlers came, the late 1800s to early 1900s, they logged most of the largest trees here and set also intentional fires at that time. Given the abundance of forests here, it's not surprising that the timber industry has always been crucial to the peninsula economy. The first sawmill was constructed in 1852 at Port Ludlow. Six years later, another was erected near here on the west shore of Discovery Bay. And the remains of a sawmill and grist mill built the following year near the mouth of Chimicum Creek can still be seen. Loggers worked 16 exhausting, dangerous hours every day. And even today, there are occasional fatalities at logging sites. The Douglas fir of the Northwest provides thick, straight, tough, fibered lumber that is much prized by builders. But it was not until after World War II that the industry realized that the future depended on responsible land management.
they were trash that we pulled out of the woods. Um, okay, well, we can talk. Well, my impression is it's going quite well. We're letting sunlight onto the forest floor. You don't see crowns competing for space and sunlight. And we've got enough sunlight on the forest floor to support an understory to thrive. Mm -hmm. And you're allowing sunlight on the ground species, so you're creating forage for wildlife. Nutrient, rich nutrient. Before you'd have foliage, but it didn't have that much nutrition because it wasn't getting any sun. Now you're getting sun down there. And it seems like they, they did a, a fairly nice job. Obviously it impacts the soil and the ground, but um, having the branches on top and doing it in the dry season minimized the rotting and the mud, and I think it'll come back fairly quickly. We live in a beautiful place, and it's important that we um, develop this next generation of stewards by engaging children on the land, seeing salmon spawn, seeing what it means to have a working forest land parcel that can provide all sorts of things for community members, um, getting out and um, seeing the estuaries and, and learning where food grows, where the food that's on their table has come from. So engaging the community in, in a meaningful way will, will continue to be a really important part of Jefferson Land Trust's work. Every couple of days I go for a walk and this is one of my routes, walk through here. So every, if a tree starts leaning over, I'll know. 